morning. Good morning. I'm Jody Krause, and I'm our scripture reader today. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open, open our, our hearts, hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The gospel lesson is John 2, 13 through 22. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as, as, well as those involved in exchanging currencies sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it is written, passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jody. Um, you know, sometimes out of the mouths of little kids comes great truth. So when you think about this church and drive by, what do you think? And he says, oh, that window. Okay. And if you come by here when the sun is down, there's even light shining on this window. Okay. And the, and the cross that's in the center. And notice about that cross. Is, is there... A man hanging on that cross? It's in a what? It's in a crown. And again, you know, when it's the perfect day and the sun's the perfect angle, those jewels in the crown light up, okay? Now, it's a little bit past the prime right now, but come back because I hear a rumor that the sun is going to change when it's in the sky when we worship next week, okay? So we'll get another chance. Thank you for brightening up that window right now but another chance for those jewels to shine. Now the thing to think about is that when we have a cross in our church, um, not disparaging any other folks, okay, but we have a cross that's a pure cross. To celebrate the cross, this instrument of death has been transformed into something glorious, okay? Paul writes about that. We, referred to in the call to worship today. But for us, we see the cross as something wondrous and glorious. Back to the sermon. We just heard Jody say, Jesus made a whip of ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. Now, the story of Jesus cleansing the temple, it's a significant story, okay? This story is found in all four Gospels. Rick, are all stories about Jesus found in all four Gospels? No, there's very few of them. Um, well, let me use one for an example. Jesus, okay, appearing to his disciples after his resurrection from the dead, is that a pretty important thing? Yeah, you'd think it would be, yeah. But in our original surviving manuscripts of the Gospels, the story of Jesus appearing to his disciples after the resurrection is in only three out of four. Okay? Pretty big story, but only three or four of them had it. Okay? So it's significant when a story appears in all four Gospels. Greg's going, but wait a minute, it is there, but then you look at the footnotes and it's in a later rent edition of that, okay? I knew you were going there, okay? So, cleansing the temple, all four Gospels, but the point today is that there's this little, this little inconsistency 
regarding the story of Jesus cleansing the temple that we heard today. Because in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the cleansing of the temple, it takes place during Jesus' final week in Jerusalem. You know the story. It happens right after that triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the event we celebrate as Palm Sunday. Okay? He marches in the town and he goes right to the temple. Okay? But here, in John's account of Jesus' life, it takes place right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Right away. Right after the first sign or miracle of, of Jesus changing the water into wine at the wedding of Cana. I had to double check this this week, went back. Jesus has not preached to the crowds yet, okay? Jesus has not even taught in any synagogues in John's account yet. But he's cleansing the temple. Now, scholars for the most part agree that if you want to really have an accurate timeline of Jesus' life, Jesus cleansing the temple takes place at the end of his ministry, okay? But I don't bring up this inconsistency for you to lose sleep. So don't lose sleep about this because if we know the Gospel of John, we also know that John does not follow an orderly chronology of Jesus' life. Okay? That's not the reason. Order and, and getting all the facts in the right order. That's not the reason that John is writing. John is writing his, his account years later to a different audience for a different person. Okay? Matter of fact, when we get to Holy Week, I mean, this just blows my mind. But John has Jesus dying on a cross on a different day than the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? And, well, Chris has been with me on this. You might have remembered me telling the kids about this. That, you know, when, when you give me time, I can tell you why John puts Jesus on a cross a different day. And then when you hear what's going on around him, it just, uh, I don't know about you, but it sends tingles just all over me. Okay? But the important point for today is that John has Jesus cleansing the temple at a different point in his ministry, right at the very beginning. And then John adds an important detail that's missing from all the other three accounts. Okay? So, Jesus. Jesus drives out the sellers of the animals for sacrifice. He drives out the money changers. Okay? We see this passion in Jesus as he enters his father's house. Now, when we were younger, our Sunday school teachers might have kind of told us that, well, there was this time when Jesus got kind of angry, okay? But I don't think that Jesus was feeling angry, okay? I think passionate is a better word, okay? Again, back to John. His disciples remember that it is written, passion for your house consumes me. And as you hear the story, you know, did you, men- did you notice that there's no mention of Jesus striking an animal in anger? There's no mention of him whipping a person in anger. No, he made a whip of cords and he drove out the sheep and the cattle and even the doves. Okay? Now, if I was a movie director, okay, of this story... I'd do that Indiana Jones thing, okay? I'd have Jesus taking this whip and then cracking it and and scaring the animals away. But if you watch the scene carefully, Jesus would not touch an innocent animal, would not touch even the people that were exchanging money with his whip. He would just make a loud cracking sound to get them out of there, okay? Now, you also got to know that there's a good reason that I'm a preacher and not some famous Hollywood director. Okay, because, you know, sometimes I, I get in onto this stuff, okay? But yeah, think about Jesus in that scene. He poured out the coins. He overturned the tables. But Jesus didn't lay a finger on anyone. It wasn't anger that Jesus was demonstrating, but a passion, a passion to make things right. A passion, a love for, so deep for his Father in heaven that, that all that buying and selling and profiting that was distracting from the worship of God had to go somewhere else. Passion. Love. And then John adds this. It's not in the others. He says, 
Then the Jewish leaders asked Jesus, By what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous signs will you show us? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jewish leaders replied, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days? The religious leaders thought that Jesus was talking crazy talk. How could one man rebuild this holy temple that in one five thousandths of the time needed? It's just crazy talk. But you know, if those Jewish authorities realized what Jesus was actually predicting, well, that would change everything they knew, right? It would change the world. It would change the rules of the universe. It would change the cosmos. Jesus wasn't talking about a building, was he? No. Jesus was talking about his dead body. By what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? And Jesus is saying, in effect, you want to know by what authority I'm doing this right now? You're going to kill me. And you're going to bury me but I will come back with a resurrected body like no one has ever seen. That is the authority in which I act. As hard to believe and as incomprehensible as that thing about destroying and raising the Jerusalem temple is, it doesn't hold a candle to Jesus predicting something as incomprehensible as rising from the dead after three days in the tomb. And by placing this story of Jesus, of the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, instead of at the end like the other Gospels, John sets the stage for the rest of his story about Jesus. Again, a careful study of John, when you do it in Bible studies, it builds and builds and builds and leads to the moment of his glory. Which, by the way, when Jesus says, my glory has come, he's not talking about his resurrection. He's talking about the cross. So at the very start of his ministry, John foreshadows the reason this story is still relevant, is still life-changing a hundred years later when he was writing it. And for us, 2,000 years later. John has Jesus at the very start predicting His passion and resurrection. Passion, there's that word again, right? Passion or zeal or affection or devotion or love. Now, there are a handful of theological theories about the atonement, okay? What's the process that allows us to be brought back into union with God? What's the process to to be made at one, atonement, at one with God, to, to heal the separation that we once had from God? What's the process? Is it, is it to have a sacrifice, a sacrifice made in our place to satisfy the need to appease a God who was wronged by us? Is that what the cross did? You know, I like to think of another way. I like to think of, of one that has more to do with the love of Jesus and the love of God. Jesus loves us. Have you ever heard that before? This I know? Yeah. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he willingly died that you, that, that we could have this gift of everlasting, abundant, eternal life. Yeah, there are many miracles in the Bible. There are many miracles throughout history. But how about this miracle? God is not some distant deity who doesn't care for us. Instead, the creator of all that is, that that ever was, that ever will be, loves you enough, cares for you enough that God died on the cross 
to save you. And this cross, it did not come as a surprise to the Son of God. Jesus knew from the very beginning, before he even preached his first sermon, or before he even healed the first person that he healed by his touch, that his death on the cross was the price. The fulfillment of his ministry would come on that hill outside of Jerusalem, where he would take his last breath on that afternoon when the sun went dark and refused to shine. It was an endeavor that would change the rules of life and death and the cosmos. And Jesus knew about it from the very beginning. And even though the disciples had their doubts, did the disciples have their doubts? Oh, yeah. They had their doubts when Jesus was arrested. What did they do? They ran away. And they had their doubts when the nails were being driven into Jesus' wrists on that cross. Where were the disciples to be found? Not there. The disciples had their doubts when Jesus actually died. And this, this Messiah of theirs, this rabbi of theirs, his dead body was being carried and laid in the tomb. They had their doubts. But John says this. Did you catch this? After Jesus was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said. And they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. From the very spark, from the very start, Jesus said this. It was a miracle that Jesus himself predicted that, the, that John in his gospel foreshadowed an unimaginable miracle that changed the cosmos. Verse 